right. Hey, happy birthday, our city. What a great day. What a great day. We made it. We made it. Uh, hey, uh, if you're new here, my name's Chris. I'm lead pastor here at Our City Church, and we are four years old today, everybody. Come on, man. Let's just... Here we are. We did it. Uh, everyone watching online, thanks for being a part of, of our ministry here. You're a part of our community, and we are very excited about this next year and what we're going to be able to do with you. And we don't see you as just some people, you know, in a camera, on a screen somewhere. We think about you. Our staff prays, considers, strategizes. Um, ask questions of each other. We're trying to figure out better ways to make sure we serve you, and so we want you to know we're glad that you are here. Um, If you uh, today have a Bible, I want you to open it to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to look into something today as a community that I think will set the trajectory of the next year together. I want today to be so clear with you about something that I believe matters significantly to our church and that I want it to matter to you. And the reason it matters to our church The reason it matters to me, as I hope you'll see in here today, is because it matters to the heart of God. And I want to do a good job today of making sure that we as a church communicate that to you. Now, if you're here and maybe you're a guest and you're kind of like wondering about like, man, there seems to be like a lot of young vibe going on here. Like all the people who told their stories were teenagers, you know, like there's a lot of youthful passion in the room. And you might have the tendency when you watch that to maybe if you're newer and you're not used to being around a church church that thinks like we do to almost feel like, I feel like this church may not be for me. Like this church seems to be for young people, but may not be for me. I understand that. And I get that. I know what it's like to go into a place and feel like this ain't for me, right? Like it's like, I know what it's like to go somewhere and feel like, ah, it feels like you kind of thought about everyone else but me. But I want you to just suspend that thought for the rest. If you don't mind for maybe the next 30 minutes, I'd like to walk you through a f- couple things. And, um, and actually I want you to hear why it is that we are the way we are and why we make no apologies about it. And I hope that when you get a clear picture of what the scripture and what God teaches about how to consider your role in a community like this, um, that it will wake something up in you, that you will have a, uh, a new thought, maybe a revelation to what the next five years, 10 years of your life might be, that maybe the way you would have lived your life might change today. And you might see that like you actually have a purpose you didn't know you had, that you might discover something today. That's my desire. My prayer for you is that you will discover, you will find something that is so much more full of purpose and you'll go, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I knew that. I've heard that. I've been around that, but that, that connected the dots, that opened my heart, that, that made it all make sense to me. There's big reason to celebrate as a church. Um, for us, we've baptized tons of people. We have put lots of people into life groups and relationships like you heard from um, uh, Katie and Jafet. Like you've heard so many things and watched these, these students come out and share that they are learning what it means to be a believer in Jesus here at our city church. And it is again because of us, those of you that make this thing happen. And we have given away hundreds of thousands of dollars to people in need as a church. We're a four-year-old church. And in the last four plus years, we have given over $500,000 away to people in need out of this church. I was secretly judging everyone not clapping just now. I want you to know that. I don't know what church you've been a part of, but half a million dollars, not here. We sent it out. We cared about others. Let it be known. Hey, let it be known that when people talk about church and what churches do and they just want your money, you could tell them about this church. You'd be like, our church don't want your money. We don't want anything from you. We do want something for you. And I want you to learn what it feels like to help somebody who can never, ever give it back to you. When you become a part of a church that will take care of people who can't give it back, there's something that comes alive in you and you become a part of something that says, look what we did. We made a massive difference. We did what we say around here, what's going to be on our banners forever. We changed the world together. We've made it through uh, a worldwide pandemic. We made it. You know how many church plants stopped and shut down, had to close doors 
They, they don't exist anymore. There's so many churches that had to close up shop and say, sorry, guys, you got to go find another church. God saw our city church through a worldwide pandemic, social unrest, uh, uh, you know, a national inflation. The air conditioning cut off on us one time. Man, shoot, they even tried to turn the lights out on us one time, but we still hear our city church. That is, we showed up. <laughs> Uh, I want you to hear today um, what it is that God, I believe, uh, a big part of what God has called us to be as a church, not just to do, but to be. And there's an important difference for me that you understand that. I don't want to be a church that just does the right stuff. I want to be a church that is that we are, that we become people. It's, and, and we do that through the things we do. There's no doubt parts of what you do helps you become that way. But I want to talk to you today, and I really want to introduce uh, our church to be able to speak to you about one of the values of our church. We've got four main values. You've heard them before. If you've been here before, if you're new, I want you to hear them. If you're watching online, checking this out, I want you to know these are the things that we here believe God's called our city church to value. We can't value, if you value everything, you value nothing. So you have to value something. And the four values for us have always been a phrase in the phrases we're all about. So what are we all about? We're all about four things. We're all about Jesus here at our city church. What's that mean? We will be known for what we're for, not what we're against. I'm never going to go like, sure everyone knows who I want to protest and, and be mad at and send to hell. That's not this church, okay? Like if you are looking for a church that wants everyone out that doesn't look, act, talk, vote like you, you're in the wrong church. We don't want that. We are about Jesus, not a political affiliation, not a candidate, not something, not some news. Not, we, don't, we don't get with that. That's not this church. This church is about Jesus and his people, and we believe we should be that kind of a church, okay? So that's us. We will lift Jesus high. We will explain Jesus well. Yes. What does that mean? We're not going to be weird. <laughs> We're not going to be spiritually weird. Some of you can't help it. You're just weird. And we're not, we're just, we're, we're glad you're here. Um, <laughs> But we're not, listen, what it means is we're never going to lift Jesus higher than we explain what we're doing to someone. Why? Because you might have been spending the last seven years working on your long lost friendship or brother or daughter, or maybe you got your mom or your dad, or your son or daughter wants to come back and they're finally going to trust you to come to the church you've been talking about. And they've seen your life change, watching you become different in tense moments. And they're like, you know what? We're going to give this whole church, God, Jesus, Bible, truth thing a try again. And they stumble into an our city church service. The last thing we will ever do is disrespect how hard you've worked, how much you've tried to change, how loving and caring you've been to this person. So they finally have put their trust in you to come to this church, we will never violate that trust. That is a sacred trust. We think through that lens. When we get together as a staff, our pastoral staff, our support staff, we think through what will their friends feel like when they're sitting next to them? Does that make sense to them? I know Christians know what we're saying. I know they know what we're talking about, but we're not just thinking about them. We will never just think about people who already believe. We will always think about who you're inviting and what it's gonna be like, and does this make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, explain it. So a lot of the things we do, we take our time with there and then. We take our time to explain what we're up to. Why? Because we are all about Jesus. We lift him high, but we will explain him well so that as you start to get it and your friends get it, they go, wow, that does, that's the first time Jesus or the Bible has ever made sense to me like that. That's critical and that's mission critical here at Our City Church. We're all about generosity. I think we've communicated that with what we've done and what we do. And you are a generous church. Per capita, what we do is unbelievable. Every pastoral friend I have in the nation, in the world, when they hear what we do and how we do it and what we go after, they're just like, we've never heard of a church that's that old doing what you guys do. And so that's a credit to how much you've decided to say, I will not live my life through the land of how much I can do for me, but how can we together do something great for others? Uh, the third one is we're all about the next generation. Yeah. You're gonna hear about that big time today. Uh, and, and that's very critical for us. Uh, as you've seen, we value the next generation, but why? Just because we like you know, kids and, and, and t you know, middle school students and high schoolers and college students? I mean, we do, but no, that's not just why. Today I want you to hear what I believe um, is scriptural. I want you to hear from the Bible. Some of you have never heard 
how important it is to the heart of God to care about the next generation. It is just a part of the values of your church, and so you kind of know it's important. We talk about it a lot. You see, you know, kids, teenagers, college students, you're kind of like, yeah, okay, okay. Today, I want to put a flag in the ground at Our City Church, and I want everyone who is a part of this to get it. I want it to connect. I want your heart to leave going, oh, got it. Let's run. Um, we're in the middle of a two-year building campaign that we want to find a permanent home. Our city, our turn. W- w- the reason this phrase says let's run is because there's a scripture verse that was written to Christians that said, let us run the race that's laid out for us. What's that mean? It means every generation of Christians have ran their race, built their church, and handed down a church that we got to inherit. And now we have, what, 2,000 years of sacrificial people, people who died for their faith, who gave to their faith, who showed up and served and, and did services that taught you God and then eventually gave you a heart for God that got you into here. And we got the church given to us. Somebody baton passed the church to us Now it's our turn, and we want to make sure we run the race for us at Our City Church so that the next generation will have a building in 20 years debt-free, and they can spend, instead of money on rent, instead of money on a mortgage, they don't have to spend money on that, okay? Because none of this is free, trust me. As much as we all love the Corona, you know, Norco Unified School District, they ain't giving us this room for free. Trust me. I signed the check. It ain't free, but listen... We want to make it something one day where instead of putting it to mortgage, instead of making a rent so you can put the church together, we pay that off in the next 20 years. We got to go get a building and we got to be a church that pays it off. But can you imagine what it would be like to spend the kind of thousands of dollars you spend in California mortgage on ministry, just on people, on teenagers, on kids, on marriages, on families? That's where we see God taking us. That's what these shirts are about. That's what our city, our turn, let's run is going to be a phrase you're going to hear us say often, and we got to do it together. And if we do it together, it'll happen. And that's our fourth one. That's we're all about God's kingdom. What does that mean? Wherever the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of hopelessness, the kingdom of evil is, we want to go in and be the kingdom of God. We're about God's kingdom invading hopelessness. We want to find people who have lost hope. We want to find people who don't have it. We want to find people in need of things we can do. We can provide that, and we want to inject God's kingdom. Today, I want to highlight what I believe has kind of been almost like the secret mission. And the way I want to do this, I want to ask ask you to think about a time when you were, I'm going to say, either a child, middle schooler, or a high schooler. Okay, when, when you were at that age and something impactful happened in your life that you right now, as you think about it, you could remember that was a really difficult time. It was a difficult time. It was something gnarly that happened. Maybe your parents, they got a divorce and that was very uh, damaging and difficult for you, right? Maybe somebody violated trust and just like it was angry and like broke stuff, through stuff and it scared you and you've, you've had that. Maybe, maybe you, you know, watch people say they were going to do one thing and do another. Maybe you grew up in an extremely difficult situation at school and things were tough and you needed more support and help, but you didn't get it. There's so many ways that you can look at. You could have had a bully that was bullying you a lot and you just never had the, the, the wherewithal to tell someone to stand up for you. Uh, there's a lot of ways that your body was changing and you were trying to figure all that out. And it was like, man, how do I figure out my life? How do I become who I'm supposed to become? And, and I also have all these things that I feel insecure about. If you think back to a time, can you imagine what your life would have been like if a caring, trustworthy, wise leader would have taken an interest in your life? And I mean a real interest, not just like hi and like something on Instagram that you post, but actually took an interest in your life. Like somebody who is older and had no reason to care about your life, except that they had something in them that said, your life matters to me. And that was it. And they treated you like that. How would you have dealt with your parents' divorce? How would you have dealt with the confusion about like the questions and challenges of being young, of just all the things that, that the peer pressure, how would you have been able to deal with certain things that maybe choices you make or made and you look back and go, I really wish I would have had a, 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 a support system. I wish I would have had a tribe or a community that would have encouraged me to stand my ground or stand on my values, but instead I wanted friendship or I wanted to be accepted so bad I just did and said things because I just so wanted that and I needed that. But if I could have got that from people who actually wanted me to make choices that were good for me, I could have avoided a lot of hurtful things. I would have stayed away from a lot of 
damaging moments. Um, what we've been doing as a church is building to this year. What do I mean by that? Uh, we've been faithfully building our city church, and uh, I would say it this way. We, uh, I want to not pivot because it's what we've been doing, but I basically believe we have been preparing to go after the next generation in a way in our city that we've never been able to do before. And I do not believe that this is something that is just for people who really like teenagers. Maybe you're like, I don't like kids, I don't like teenagers. I don't like... It doesn't matter. It, this isn't your personality profile. Okay, if you are a part of our city church today or you're leaning in and wanting to know more, what I hope you hear today is this isn't really something that is just about how do you get along with kids, teenagers, college students, and all the rest? This is a central heartbeat to the heart of God. It is in Scripture. It is throughout Scripture. What we want at Our City Church is to be the premier place for the next generation. We want this place to be, and the building we'll get in the next year or two, we want this to be the premier place for families to bring their children, for middle school students to come, for high school students to find their identity and to know how to have a tribe that will band around them, for college students to know they have a safe place to work out their, their beliefs and to come and to be encouraged and loved and supported, especially when they have to go back into a world that may not support some of their values or their beliefs. And I know that some of you thought that's cool and you see it and it's cool, but in your mind it might be, well, that's someone else's job, right? That's what Pastor Kellen's been doing all these years, right? I mean, that's what Pastor Mike was doing. That's what the team does. That's what you guys do. That's what everybody else does. And you might have believed that, like, you know, that's kind of like what it was. But I, I want you to know, we want you in your adult life group, and I want you to be a part of this church. But I want every single person in our city church to know that the heart of God is to always lean in to the next generation. And we're going all in as a church We've made a very, very important and a critical hire to our pastoral staff. Um, it is not easy to get um, next level, like top grade talent in any industry. And church is no different, okay? And I want you to know that I can think of 15 churches bigger than us, bigger budgets than us, with more ability, buildings, and all the rest all around this nation that wished they could have hired the pastor that we got to hire. Pastor Jimmy Banks and Heather have been some of the greatest national youth pastors. They have built one of the most amazing youth ministries over the span of, that spans over a decade. And the fact that God sent them to us is a signal to me that we have been on the right track, that where we're going with the next generation requires more than just killing more, running out there doing it. That's too much for one leader to do. We're going to now be able to allow Kellen to hone in on the things he's going to be amazing and continue to be amazing at. And they're going to partner together to be able to build out what we believe God has for us to be. But it needs not just your thoughts and your good wishes and high fives to the kids as they walk through the hallway. This needs, this has to get deep into your heart. And for us to be able to do that, I want you to be able to hear today uh, and I could do it. I love the next generation. I bleed for the next generation. I'm going to give my life for the next 20 years, 25 years, to building the next generation. But I didn't want today for you to hear on our city's birthday. I so believe that God wanted us to bring in Pastor Jimmy. I so believe that he is the right man, the right leader, the right pastor to get into our schools and to raise up a group of adults who are going to run life groups and open up their homes and be in these young people's lives. I so believe that between him and Kellen, our middle school students and our kids are going to get the best experience to learn who they are and what their value is. And I want you to hear today why it is so critical. But for that, I want you to be able to do that from... Uh, the one I think God has sent. And so I'm going to invite now uh, Pastor Jimmy up, and he's going to share what God has from his word. Would you guys give it up to the pastor of our city church, Pastor Jimmy Banks? Get him, boy. Get him. Happy birthday. 
All right, all right, all right, sit down, let's go. Uh, one of the things I love about uh, my experience so far at this church, if you were during meet and greet and they were like, if you've been here less than three months, I'm with you. Uh, I've only been here a few months, uh, but yeah, I've had such an incredible journey so far. And, and like, like Pastor Chris said, I get, to, I get to help show you the heart of God throughout scriptural history for the next generation. It's something that my wife and I um, have committed to. Uh, we just opened up our lives and said, God, we'll go wherever you want us to go. We feel like he pointed us in this direction uh, to do next-gen ministry. Now listen, I'm 38 years old. I have no business being a youth pastor. So you better believe that this is me just continuing um, uh, like generations before me saying, I will not grow old until I faithfully passed on my faith the next generation. And so I'm living it. My wife and I are living it. We're so glad that we're here. Pastor Chris and I, when we got to be hanging out, we're talking about the way that we teach and the way that we preach and like all the different things. And, and I was telling him, I'm like, oh, I got this really cool concept. Like every time I preach the Bible, I'm not letting people to be in the room without understanding the world of the Bible. And so I do this thing where I talk about timeless truth and truth in time. And, and then he was like, oh, I did this thing called there and then. And I'm like, you're so much smarter than me. That's much easier. <laughs> right? Timeless truth and truth in time. What does that even mean? <laughs> and so I get to hop into this moment and talk about the there and then in Scripture. We talked about Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because how are you supposed to know the truth of the Bible if you don't understand the world of the Bible? The there and then that's happening. Uh, this is a historical document. So I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to go 3,000 years into history. And it begins by just saying, hear Israel, hear O Israel. And it's like, okay, so who's they, who are they talking to? Um, it's like one of those moments, you know, any parents in the room today? Any parents? All right? There's sometimes it's like, kids, are you listening? Okay, listen up, right? I got something important to say. That's all this is saying is here, oh, Israel. Now, the people that are being talked to right now are being talked to by a guy by the name of Moses. The moment in history that we are talking about here, there, and then is this moment to where there's an entire people group called the, the nation of Israel. They've just been set free from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Literally, God set them free. And, and they get set free. And like, if you've ever like, read the story, you can go read it. It's in the book of Exodus. It's incredible. Uh, or the book of Genesis into the book of Exodus. And it's this incredible story of how like, they were enslaved. And then God sent these like 10 plagues to like, make fun of the gods of Egypt and to show that he's the real God and there are no other gods. And, and then, the, then they escape. And as they escape, there's this Red Sea moment where they're like, we have a, a Red Sea in front of us and an army behind us, an impossible situation. And Moses, the leader, says, stand firm and see the salvation of our God. And then the Red Sea parts and they walk through on dry ground. And the very thing that gave them freedom was the very thing that the enemies of Egypt walked into and it destroyed them. And so quite literally, God set them free. And I think it's the birthday. We can celebrate things we love about this church. I love there and then. I also love like the heartbeat of the church. We are here to help people find God and experience life in Christ. You know, this is kind of like that moment where we want people to be set free to find God, to get out of old patterns of living and start to be, to live in new ways of living. And so it's like, this is kind of like their find God moment. They were enslaved and now they're free. We want uh, everyone in our lives, we want them to not be in hurtful patterns of life, but we want them to be living in the best way that God has created them to live. So that's kind of like the find God part. But how many know that you could be set free, but you still got to learn how to live free? It's a whole new way of living for 400 years. Think about the patterns and the, and the ways families were being raised and they were being told that you're not worth anything, you're a slave, or like the way a, a child would grow up and be like, why are they get all this and I get this and, and the patterns of thinking they would have and just like the coping mechanisms that they would live with. And, and so they've been set free, but they've got to learn how to live set free. And that's kind of like the second part of why I love this church. Find God, be set free, but experience life in Christ, live set free. Galatians even says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. There's two types of freedom there. And so that's where this moment in like Deuteronomy 6 is happening. This is actually called the prayer of Shema. And Shema just literally means here. So it's like the prayer of here. This is so important. And, and I want you to see how important this is 
Because when you see the content, then you'll understand it. But you need to understand how important this is. This prayer of Shema is the, the leader Moses getting from God how, how to live set free, how to not have those negative patterns and not live the way you've lived for 400 years, but there's a new way of living. Quite literally, if you're reading the first five books of the Bible, it's God saying, here's how to be a people set apart, a people not to live in slavery. Here's how to be like a, a better way to live. And I want you to be marked. I want you to be my people. And this is kind of the beginning of that. So important that they literally trained their children to speak by using this prayer. And, and every morning, a, 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 a good Jewish family would pray this prayer every single morning. And they would pray this prayer every single evening. And they, if you're still a good practicing Jew, you are still doing that today for 3,000 years. This is how important this prayer is that we're about to read. They, not only do they teach their children how to speak with this prayer, they also, like, it's like if you're trying to memorize it, the first thing they want you to memorize, your formative language was formed around this prayer, the prayer of Shema. It's also like when you're dying and you're on your deathbed, it's like one of the last things you breathe or you say before your last breath. This is how important this prayer has become. So let's go back to there and then. Let's go back to that moment. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, the Shema, prayer of Shema. Hear, O Israel. Shema means hear. So listen up. This is important. How do you live set free? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. So the content of it is, you're like, oh, I've heard this before, right? You're supposed to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. It's almost like, remember, like there's this moment in the New Testament uh, where these guys are trying to trick Jesus. Uh, this is about a thousand years later. Uh, they're trying to trick Jesus. And they're like, what's the most important commandment in all the law? And Jesus easily answers, it's love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. We pray it every morning. We pray it every night. This isn't a hard question. And then he adds, love others, and they all lose their minds. That's another sermon for another day. They're like, you can't change a thousand years of history, Jesus. And he's like, watch me. I almost did a human video there. Like, death, res resurrection, watch me. Like, <laughs> stupid, I'm sorry. So yeah, this is so important. Love the Lord our God. And then it says these two incredible things. He says, these words I command you shall be on your heart and you should teach them to your children. So a moment ago, I said, if there's any parents in the room, the number one thing we need to do as a church family is that these words need to be on our hearts first. We need to find God, experience life in his name. We need to understand it and grow in our own relationship in a healthy, vibrant relationship. Our city church, the best thing we can do for the next generation is to have an authentic relationship with God. It's the best thing we can do, but it doesn't stop there. And we can't stop there as a church. We've got to also say, we will teach it diligently to our children. It has to go beyond us and to the next generation. I spent all that time building up how important this prayer was. They did it every morning, every night, formative language at the end of your life, beginning of your life. It, the repetition of this thing is, is that I've got to have this on my heart and I've got to teach this diligently to my children, to the next generation. It's so important. Fast forward to the reign of King David. Um, he's uh, one of the kings of the nation of Israel. You're going from like uh, Deuteronomy and then you have the, the era of the judges and then they get a king named Saul. He jacks everything up. And the reason I'm fast forwarding through scripture is because I want you to see like over scriptural history, this is a theme that it's on God's heart. So now we have King David um, and now it, things are kind of like messed up because King Saul kind of messed things up and he allowed other gods to be worshiped. And it was just like a whole thing. He messed it up. That's all you need to know. And then King David gets on the throne and he's like, look, we've got to get back to Shema. We've got to get back to what God originally intended us to experience life in his name. And in Psalm 78, four through seven, this is, uh, this is what he says. He says, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power, about his mighty wonders. Like the vision that he's giving here is so strong of being like, this is what this kingdom is going to look like. We will not hide these truths from the next generation. 
And then verse five, he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. Referencing Shema, like a second ago, like I just said. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. I just wanna pause there in that moment, they in turn. If this is our city, it's our turn to make a difference in the next generation, right? So each generation in turn. I love it, four years, I'm the new guy. I love everything about this church and I'm in, moving my family from Texas, being there for a decade to live out here in California with your inflation and I can't eat right now. Like, that's how much I believe in this. I'm just kidding. Thankful for your generosity as a church. (laughs) I believe in this, but it's like, it's our turn. It's our city, it's our turn to make a difference in the next generation. It's part of our heartbeat as a church because it's the heartbeat of our God. We will tell the next generation about who God is and what he's done. We will, we have to. Fast forward to Jesus showing up on the scene. How does he change the world? Like Pastor Chris said, every one of his disciples except one was a teenager. He's modeling, I'm going to have the next generation with me and around me. And that is the way that we are going to live our lives. It's not just me, it's gonna go beyond me. It's gonna go beneath me, it's gonna go to them. Fast forward a little bit more, uh, just after Jesus, probably 20, 30 years after Jesus, you have Paul. He writes a lot of the New Testament, pretty much from Romans on. Uh, He writes all of these, he's like an early church leader. um, And and he's like just, he's like a church planner. Uh, He's planting churches in Galatia. That's why I have a letter to Galatians. He's planted a church in Philippi. That's why he has a letter to the church of Philippi. And so he's like this like master church planner. And every time you see Paul, he's always had, he always has someone of the next generation with him. It's Paul and Silas, it's Paul and Timothy, it's Paul and Barnabas, it's Paul and John Mark. Everywhere he goes, he's literally just says, I wanna be faithful and to be faithful is to be like Moses, it's to be like David, it's to be like Jesus and it's to be like the heartbeat of God. I've gotta make sure this doesn't just stay with me, it's gotta go beyond me. So I just gave you three, I just gave you over uh, 1500 years of like church history. Now I'm gonna fast forward another 2,000 years to where we're at today and saying, what will it be like for us as a church? What will we do for the next generation? If this is the heartbeat of God, what will we do for the next generation? And I believe that God created us. I believe that our origin comes from him and we have design and I believe that he knows the best way for us to live. But because we, I know all of those things to be truth, I can go to other sources as if they're discovering truth, but I'm like, nah, we've been learning this for thousands of years. We've been living this for thousands of years. There's this book, uh, it's called The Grown-Up's Guide to Teenage Humans. It's a really cool book. It's by this guy by the name of Josh Shipp. Uh, he was actually grown up in the foster system. For every marker on his life, he should have just like ended up in just like a tailspin. Um, he ends up at Harvard, read him up, it's, he's really cool, his name's Josh Shipp. And Harvard does a study to where they come to this conclusion, and I'm gonna read that to you from his book, um, Josh Shipp, uh, uh, Josh Shipp, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> S-H-I-P-P, two P's to emphasize there's no T. Um, I mean, it's California, I guess. I'm adopting, <laughs> I'm adopting your budget, your, your language, all of it. Um. <laughs> Listen to this. This is from Harvard 2017. The single most common factor for children who develop resilience is at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult. Like This is Harvard coming out with this information and we're just like, we've known this for thousands of years. This is how we operate as a church. But it's so true because my kids are set because I have a wife and they have one committed person in their life. Like I'm good. (laughs) Like, all right, yes. Thank you, Heather. You know, Pastor Chris and I love to talk about what what it's gonna look like for our church and, you know, 
we all have patterns and our worldview is just a collection of the stories that we've grown up with and that's how we see God. I see God through the ways my parents communicated God to me, who he is and what he's done. I see God through the experiences that my parents allowed me to be in and around other loving, fruitful adult Christians um, who I could call sometimes when my parents weren't cool anymore and I wanted to hear from them, right? Uh, parents, how many of us know that like when they're not listening to you, I, like me, the pastor or their small group leader or another adult could say the same exact thing and they'll come home and be like, oh, you should hear what my leader said. I've been saying that to you for years, right? <laughs> like it happens all the time. Like that's what we're trying to do as a church. But parents, I need you to hear this loud and clear. Pastor Chris is way too nice. I'm not that good of a youth pastor. But what I am good at is inspiring other people to not sit on the sidelines, but to lace up and start running and saying, it's our turn to make a difference in the next generation. And those are that done in two primary ways. Parents, Pastor Kellen and I are here to equip you to be the discipler of your children. You cannot punt on this. You cannot give this off to somebody else. So parents, I want you to hear, this starts with you. And, and, and I'm learning South, uh, South Cal, what is it, South California? I should never say that. <laughs> wow. I'm learning SoCal ways of saying things, <laughs> understanding the culture. South California, it's the worst, bro. <laughs> Everyone's here like, you really brought this guy? Um, <laughs> parents, it starts with you. Pastor Kellen, Pastor Kellen and I want to equip you to be the best parent that you can possibly be, you cannot punt on their spiritual development. You can't punt. And you can't hand that to me and Kellen. That, that's not what we're going to do. There's going to be people that come out of our city who parents don't care, and we will be the primary discipler of them. But when it comes to you, parents, we want to come alongside you and echo the truth that they're hearing at home and make you cool because we're saying the same thing that you're saying and say your parent is the most incredible parent that I know. Listen to what they have to say. They have wisdom, and we're here to come alongside you because if all they need is one caring adult, let me summarize that statement. We believe that every kid is one caring adult away from a better future. That's what the book says. One caring adult away from a better future. We believe that. To help them go through, like, as they grow up, a child into a, a preteen, into a middle schooler, into a high schooler, into a college-age student, into a young adult navigating the world. They're, they got rough seas out there, and they've got to go through body changes. They've got a lot of stuff to navigate. We just want to make sure there's some people going through it with them. A buffer between them and dysfunction. A, a person there to say, hey, I want to help you see God. But if it's just one caring adult away from a better future, how about we double down on that? How about we double down on that as a church and be like, we can't just do the status quo around here. What if the parents stood up, stood up and said, we will disciple our children and we will help you, we will give you resources. But then what if everybody in our church said, I also am in to help these parents because we are going to do our city, our turn to make a difference for the next generation. I'm gonna to add to it, we believe that every kid is one caring adult from a better future and a better faith. This has always been the heart of God. It's always been the heart of God. Teach it diligently to your children. Pass it on to the next generation. We will tell the next generation about who God is, about what he's done in human history. And if you think about it, your worldview as an adult is from Caring, loving adults, whether it be your parents or someone else who stood into your life, a coach or someone like that who st stepped into your life and helped you see God clearly. Some negatively, <laughs> but that's not gonna be us as a church. We will help them see who God is and what he's done. And so God is always asking, whose faith is gonna be better because of you? God is always asking whose life will be better because of you. Another thing I love about this church, uh, it's a birthday. I'm allowed to just keep saying things I love about this church. Find like living this life for Jesus doesn't make your life easier. It makes your life better. And when life gets hard, when you are alone, you can be defeated. But when you are together, you are strong. 
so we will not let the next generation navigate this world alone, but they will have committed parents and a committed church. And together, that's how we change our city, our next generation as a church. So you've got to begin to get to this place to saying, okay, am I doing my part? The easiest question is, is, well, is there a younger person who knows your name, knows your story that you're pouring your life into? Oh, and let me talk about the genius of God for a second. The genius of God is this, is that the number one way for you to grow in your own faith adult is for you to teach it to someone else. That is the number one way for you to grow in your faith. And so this isn't a, hey, forget you, peace out, you know, we're out here, adults. No, we're saying, when you learn to tell the next, when they ask you the craziest questions, right now we're debating what truth is in high school right now. Where do we get truth from? How do you understand where truth comes from? I'm on the couch being like, Jesus loves you, this I know. For the I'm just kidding. So you just gotta ask yourself, Which teen will find Jesus because of you? Which child will know that God is a loving God because of you? Which young adult will not deconstruct their faith because we were a church that said, we are all about Jesus, God's kingdom, generosity, and the next generation. It's our city, it's our turn to make a difference in the next generation. That's what we're gonna do, church. We're gonna do what Jesus wants us to do and what he did. Um, how can you make this a part of your life to leave today? Uh, well, I would like to ask some of you to just totally recommit to the idea of church as you've just heard scripture teach you through Pastor Jimmy. To reorient your whole belief system around what does a church function like and to reconsider everything about it for yourself. Of course, you should come and grow yourself. Of course, you're going to learn things for you. But I want to make sure that in a ever so selfish, me first culture, that culture does not lead us. Jesus leads us. And his spirit is always who's coming up behind me and who's coming up underneath me that my life will impact because I follow Jesus. And that's what he taught me to do. And if we as a church will do that, Five years from now, mark my words, with your help, as God's spirit will lead us, we will see a group of young people that are gathered together that a room like this won't be able to hold. We will make an impact on the college campuses around here, our high school campuses, our middle school campuses. Our children will come to know who they are we will help families. We will do this. It is what we are going to do. And my desire, my ask of you is to say, God, I belong to you. And if that's what church is always supposed to have, and I'm a part of your church, show me where I fit in. Show me how to do it. And he said it well. It starts with you. God, I want to love you first so I have a love to give away. And God, let me just give what I do have. You don't have to have the greatest, biggest, grandest faith. Just give the faith you do have away because that's what they need. They just need someone whose honest reflections of their faith is being shared with them. How can you practically do some of these things? I'm gonna give you a couple things I wrote up just because I thought that would help us. I want you, if you have kids, teenagers, whatever, I want you to encourage your kids. Make sure your children know, your teenagers know, we will pick up your friends if you'll invite them to church. We will pick them up. I will meet their, I, I will go and meet their, their parents. I, I will go make sure, I will make sure that I'm behind you, son or daughter. If you will, ask your friends, we'll pick them up. We'll figure that out. And I don't know if that means we've got to take two rides because you guys start inviting. We will figure this out, but mom and dad are behind you. If you are an aunt or an uncle, you're a big brother, or a big sister, you're a college student, you're, you know, you, you have your own job capability to do that. 
Let the ones that you meet around, hey, I want you to know if you ever need, here's my number. You can text. You can be someone. I can help you. I can get, I, I will help you. Let them know, like, in your support system, in your family, like, if you ever want to come to, I want to be there for you. Um, invite them. Offer to, offer to you know, to, to be there for them in their lives. Um, I also want to ask you to pray. I want to ask you to pray when you drive through high school, middle school, elementary school zones. I would love it if our church never for the rest of the time we are a church drove by a school and didn't stop to pray. The same way many of you, and I know you do this because I've been in cars with you, you do it when you see an ambulance. You do it when you see a fire truck. You do it when you see law enforcement, a police officer. You see them responding to urgency and you instantly pause what you're doing. Me, Brennan, Eliana, we do it all the time as well. We stop God. I don't know where they're going. Preserve life. I ask that you would save life, that you would give them wisdom, help these um, first responders to do what they can to save life. And that's a prayer that we make. I want to ask you to adopt that same urgency over the next generation. And when you drive by a school, you drive by a bunch of kids, you're walking, even if you're just by yourself in the mall, and you see a bunch of kids being total knuckleheads, messing it all up, and you're just like, what are these kids these days becoming? <laughs> Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. As a part of this church, that's not how we're going to talk about teenagers. That's not how we're going to talk about middle schoolers. That's not how we're going to talk about. We're not going to shame them and think that that's going to incite them to want to know our Jesus. We're going to believe in them. We're going to see the good they could become. We're going to have hope for them. We're going to pray for them. We're going to serve them. We're going to love them. And when we walk by and see them, we're going to say, Lord, I don't know, I don't know why they're acting like that. I don't know what homes they came from. I don't know what they're dealing with. I don't know how they're hurt. But I just pray somehow, some way, God, you get into their heart and let them know that they're loved and you have a plan and a purpose for their life. What would happen in a city if just us, online and in this room, we shifted and became that way towards the next generation? Instead of tolerating them, we celebrated them. We, we would change the world in our own area. I'm gonna ask you on Wednesday nights uh, for some of you to get involved. I wanna ask to ruin the next month of Pastor Jimmy's life by how many people are going to ask him to get involved and say, I want you to know, here's my name, my number, here's how I can help. Uh, I want you, I give you permission to get involved with Pastor Kellen. Go to Pastor Kellen and say, hey, what, how can I serve? How can I be a part? Some of you, you could come to me and say, Pastor Chris, I want to help and I have capacity to do some things to move the needle around here and I want to do it. And I hear the vision and here's what we'd like to do about it. Or is there something we can do specifically? Here's what we want to do. Let us know because that's where we're going. And if we all do what God has gifted and called us to do, um, I think we're going to bless God's heart, but we're going to change the city. We're going to change this world. Um, I'm going to ask some of you to not date people who don't want to be a part of something like this. And I certainly think that <laughs> the, the, the example that we saw in our video today, be, be on the watch, um, <laughs> that, dude, that dude was telling all kinds of lies in the video. I'm like, man, man. <laughs> the first time I ever wanted someone to not be in church. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm a pastor. But I, I mean it. I want, if you're single and you're, you know, college age and, you know, you're out there kind of, man, I, I want you to consider like, hey, I want to be with someone who has a heart for the things God's heart is for. And he's for the next generation. I can tell you right now, I, f I fell in love with Brenda because of Brenda's heart for Jesus and her heart for other young people. When I saw how much she came around and she wanted to start serving all the students that I love, and I'm like, man, here's this young woman. She's amazing. She's awesome. But, man, she really cares about the next generation. And you will find yourself a lifelong partner if you have values that Jesus values. And his values are always for who's coming behind me and who's underneath my influence, that I can make sure their faith will be better, their life will be better, because I was in their life. Let me pray for you as we go. Lord. Um, I guess in my own way, Lord, I, I kind of want to say this for myself. I would like to recommit my own heart to the things that your heart is committed to. And I know it's in our values. I wrote those values. Um, I know it's in our bylaws. I wrote the bylaws. But I want to make sure that I don't ever have something hanging on the walls that is not inside my heart. And so I, I ask even in my own heart, that you would reconnect, God, me to the depth of love you have for the next generation. I ask, God, you would help me to lead this church towards your heart and towards our impact that you have for us. 
I pray you would give us the building you have for us, God, in the next year or two, that we would be able to house the next generation, that we would be able to do youth nights, and we'd be able to do life groups, and we'd be able to have things for, the, for our church, God, to experience who you want us to become. God, I pray that you would give Pastor Jimmy and Pastor Kellen and Pastor Katie and Heather, God, I pray that they would be anointed for the work ahead that we would rally around your vision for our city church and our city youth and our city kids. I pray you would raise up an army of college students, of, of young professionals, God, still in their 20s and their 30s, that don't see their life just to go get it for themselves. But I ask you would pivot their heart for the next generation as well, and that they would give their time to teenagers and to middle school students and to kids, God, and that we together as a whole church would see to it that we take our turn, God, running the race laid out for us, and we will leave it better for who comes behind us, and we will look after who's coming behind us, and they will have a better life, as Pastor Jimmy preached, and they will have a better faith. Build that church. Build that, our city church. And I commit my heart to that. I commit our church to that end, Lord. And I bless you for the picture I see in my mind, God. I can't wait for a few years to go by so we can live in what you're going to use us to do. Change the world through us, Jesus. I ask this in your mighty name. Oh, if everyone would say amen. amen. Hey, if you are new around here and you like what you heard, uh, we've got a meet and greet that I would love for you to sign up for. It's just a time to connect with me and a, um, a couple of our other leaders, pastors, my wife. Um, we'd like to just connect with you personally. It's Sunday. You can join me and Brenda. We just want to buy you something to eat, buy you a drink, and just get to know your story a little bit. Um, so you can scan the QR code up there, and we're going to leave that up there. Also, we have a Next Steps. It's a big blue banner that says Next Steps, and that's out there. If you're new around here, please do that. It's one of the best ways, the fun ways for us just to go hang out. Um, we're going to go out to, I think, Dos Lagos somewhere over there, or the crossings, and we'll have a meal. So if you would sign up for that, I would love to meet you personally and just know you. My wife wants to meet you. Some of our team would love to meet you. Um, also, we have a birthday shirt for everyone as a gift. So if you would like that, please go out to the birthday shirt um, area. Um, and we want to make sure we bless you with that. Wear them loud. Wear them proud. Y'all, let's run. Lace up. Let's run. Let's go change the world together. See you next week. See you guys. Bye. Great job, boy. Look at us, man. Look at the church we built. I'm done.